For questions to the Minister of Education, and we will start with listed questions. I call Mr. Philip Smith. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question one, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The statutory curriculum places significant emphasis on developing the core skills sought by employers and preparing young people for the work face. Uh, pupils have opportunities to acquire and develop cross-curricular skills of communication using mathematics and using ICT. Thinking skills and personal capabilities, problem solving, self-management and working with others are also mandated within the curriculum. At post-primary level, the curriculum covers the local and global economy, career management and enterprise and entrepreneurship. Young people investigate the need for creativity and enterprise, whether as an employer or employee, and identify and develop skills and attributes associated with uh, being enterprising. The entitlement framework ensures that pupils studying at Key Stage 4 or post-16 have access to a broad range curriculum of a balanced range of economically relevant and individually engaging courses. The entitlement framework uh, requires all post-primary schools to provide pupils with access to a minimum of 24 courses at Key Stage 4 and 27 at uh, post-16, of which at least one-third must be general and one-third applied. To enhance the delivery of the curriculum, my department provides funding to a num number of organisations to provide enterprise, employability and innovation programmes um, and events, both for primary and post-primary, both inside and outside school. Developing effective links between schools and the business sector, I think, is also an important aspect in developing business skills in schools and ensuring our young people can appreciate the full range of progression routes open to them. Mr Smith, first supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, has the Minister considered cross-departmental cooperation on this issue, uh, for example, the implementation of projects such as university technical colleges for 14 to 19 year olds as they do in England? I think there's always merit in exploring where we can actually look at uh, cross-departmental work, particularly in this aspect. And I think that applies both between departments and indeed outside into the industry. Uh, I'm struck by the, the need, particularly as we move ahead in terms of looking at the curriculum, in a degree of cooperation, particularly between schools and further education colleges, which obviously employs the uh, impacts in on the Department of the Economy. And I think there's, uh, there's opportunities there for a degree of a greater level of nexus between uh, those departments and indeed between the, the, the skills. I think it's also important that we have a high, high level of engagement with those directly at the, at the coal face. And so, for instance, recently I've met with the CBI. Uh, to discuss their thoughts. And I know that uh, they, in the relatively near future, I think are due to produce a report um, across the, the whole of the UK looking at, if you like, the better linkages. And so, therefore, I'd be keen to, to tap into that and keen to carry on uh, those discussions. There are obviously a range of activities that are already involving schools with outside bodies, such as Young Enterprise, for instance. Um, but I think it's, it's important that those linkages. The other issue, I suppose, really, I think there's the more that we can encourage, for instance, those from a business background to have a direct hands-on involvement in schools, and certainly I would encourage, for instance, as opportunities arise, for instance, in terms of school governorships, for those from a, a business background to apply for those. Because I think if we can broaden and ensure that the skill set of those volunteers who provide that, that work in terms of the uh, boards of governors, I think that is also something which is, is useful. So it's about embracing all of that. I'm certainly open to seeing that, that greater level of cross-departmental work. Ms. Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Might I ask the Minister um, what is being done to promote digital skills in schools? Well, thank you, Member, for your question. Work is progressing by my department. Uh, again, uh, without I suppose preempting um, uh, Mr. Smith's previous question, it is this is a cross uh, departmental basis. So work's progressed by my department, the Executive Office, Department for Communities, Department of the Economies, to progress a digital skills programme. Uh, Digi Skills NI, and it's got three main aims. To create an innovative uh, long-term strategic partnership between industry, education and communities. To maximise um, sustainable development, building capacity and empowering education. And to develop skills pipeline for generation of young people, creating an informed society and developing synergies between industry and education. Uh, Digi Skills NI believes that it's it, it should be like digital uh, learning in schools programme will help build that capacity within formal education for digital skills and computing. So it works at an early stage, but I think the hope is that we will have something that will be innovative and a collaborative programme which will help to ensure that we are on track to position Northern Ireland as a leading provider of digital skills in education. I suppose 
as with this aspect, as with other things, it's important as a society that we are, as much as possible, ahead of the curve, rather than simply trying to do catch up with other societies. Ms. Jennifer McCann. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the minister, um, given you know the, the he mentions about the curriculum, will he ensure that the same uh, sort of priority as academics is given to academic subjects in school will be given to vocational subjects in school, and to ensure that children will have that um, you know broad-based sort of choice when they're choosing what they're doing in the curriculum? That's an important issue. Um, we're in a situation that it's been approximately 10 years since it was the last overall review of the curriculum. I think that's something that we'll be doing during this term. So even if everybody thought everything was absolutely perfect within the curriculum, I think that that's something that needs to be uh, looked at. It needs to be looked at uh, both in the primary and post-primary uh, settings. And I think it's important that we actually develop pathways to give that level of, of clear recognition and regard, uh, particularly to vocational subjects. Now, where I'm a little bit careful of is that, that those should be something which, which operates in tandem together, so it's not necessarily seen as an either-or, because I think if it's, if it's seen as a zero-sum game of, if you like, improving the provision for vocational subjects at the expense of academic or some sort of rebalancing in that sense, I think that would be the wrong way to look at it. I think we need to ensure that there are a range of different pathways that are available to our pupils and therefore, if you like, that they have the maximum opportunities uh, within particularly work and with the rest of their lives and that they're well prepared for that. And I think that work will be a key element as we move forward on the issue of the curriculum. I think as part of that as well, I've mentioned um, Department of the Economy, CBI and other such, such organisations. I think the involvement of, of some of those bodies external to the Department of Education and external to schools will also be critical because I think we need to look at this uh, in a slightly more holistic way and not simply look at what is purely happening um, that can be purely delivered by schools as well. I think it's about trying to ensure that we get the needs of all our young people fit for the 21st century in that regard. Members, before I call Mr Keith Buchanan, can I remind the members that this question is a specific question to the Mid-Ulster constituency. Mr Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Mr Speaker. Question two, please. Thank the member for his question. Um, in terms of the investment in special schools, there's one special school in Mid-Ulster, uh, Kilronan Special School, and so from the 1st of April 2013, the Department has invested approximately £8 million in Kilronan Special School. Uh, in terms of breakdown, um, that is approximately £6.7 million in resource funding and £1.3 million on capital investment, uh, really for, particularly for minor works, such as an extension to the building and the creation of a, a sensory garden. Call Mr Buchanan for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can the Minister confirm what action he is taking regarding the overall funding pressure on and relation to special educational needs? You know, one of the, I suppose, we are in a situation in particular in terms of special ed education needs. Thankfully, we're seeing, for instance, earlier diagnosis uh, of problems in terms of special needs, which allows us to have an earlier level of intervention. Obviously, that will mean that there's an increasing level of um, demand um, in relation to SEN support and costs associated with that. And so, for example, if you simply take a snapshot of the children with an SEN statement as one measure of that, the percentage of all students uh, with an SEN statement has increased from 4.3% uh, four years ago to the latest figures of 4.9%. So a significant amount of the EA's budget is being spent on special educational services, and that can be a range of things. It can be the special schools, the support services, classroom assistance and transport costs. Uh, special education funding has been prioritised as much as possible as part of the budget setting process over the last number of years. An additional funding for SEN has been secured, for instance, in the last monitoring round. There was £5 million secured um, from the Finance Minister as part of in-year monitoring. This is very much a demand-led service, so should the EA identify budget pressures for SEN and those can't be met from the uh, existing education budget, I'll continue to work with executive colleagues to ensure that, uh, that we secure additional funding for that. Well, Ms Sandra Overhand. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. Um, I wonder, does the Minister have the statistics to hand, but can he detail uh, the number of, uh, of pupils attending Kilronan School and whether that has met uh, the demand for places at Kilronan over the past five years? Um, uh, because I know that certainly from uh, speaking to them, that is an issue in our local area in Mid Ulster. And will he give serious consideration to a new capital build for Kilronan Special School? Taking the, the point, um, 
I don't have the exact figures to hand. I know Kilronan covers the, the full remit in terms of um, special, school, special needs schools because it covers children right from three up to 19, uh, and therefore it's a very productive model. Obviously, the assessment of numbers on special school is on a slightly different basis than from mainstream schools. Uh, I mean, I'll get the, in terms of the detail of the numbers of, of pupils, I'll be happy to get that uh, to the, the member. Um, in, terms of, in terms of capital build, all these issues are considered as part of the overall calls for capital build, in which is essentially a, a level of open competition. And I suppose one of the uh, restrictions and maybe frustrations that, that all of us will have is that in terms of a capital budget, it could be spent three or four times over at least in any one particular year. So whenever there will be calls for um, for capital build, be it by way of a school enhancement programme or major capital works, there will be, if you like, the opportunity for all schools to bid for that. They will then be graded according to uh, the matrix of, of needs and indeed a, a scoring system. So there will be every opportunity. Given the nature of that, therefore, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on an individual school to say that particular school will be given priority. There will be fair and open competition uh, for those, those places on it. But I think everybody is aware of the, the need to provide that particular level of um, support for special schools. And I think uh, as we move ahead in the near future towards area planning, there will be a specific section on special schools within the area planning process that will also um, form part of the assessment of the way forward in terms of the future as well. well Mr. Ian Mill. Will the Minister, <coughs> excuse me, will the Minister ensure that the nursery school provision for special needs schools such as Kilrun uh, will be Meet, will meet the needs of children with complex needs and their families. In, in terms of the issue of placement of, of children in terms of nursery places, and particularly in terms of the special needs side, obviously that's an operational matter directly for the EA. Always want to make sure that, that the provision that we're providing is, is entirely adequate and indeed fit for purpose on that basis. Um, if it's an issue over either a capital project or development proposal, that will have to be sort of a, a particular decision will have to be taken over those. So it's a limited amount. Uh, I can comment directly on that, but I want to try to ensure that any facilities, particularly for special needs children, is adequate to what is, to what is needed. And I think we've got to realise as well that, particularly dealing with special needs, we're, we're talking about something where um, there is, I think, through a virtuous way, there's, we are talking about a changing picture over the years. Fortunately enough, for instance, we are seeing, particularly with severe learning difficulties, some children who would not um, in many years, many years ago, would have survived to, to school age, now able to enter the school system, uh, surviving, indeed growing into adulthood. So there's a constantly changing position as regards um, special needs, and I think we need to make sure that, again that we're providing sufficient, uh, if you like, sort of that we're up, constantly up to date to ensure that what we're getting for uh, children in that position meets the needs of, of, of that category of children. Before I call Ms Bradshaw, a reminder that this is a question which is specific to the constituency. I call Mr. Sorry, Linda Dillon. Cash um, I had a. I thank the member for a question. An introductory meeting. I've met the Minister of Education and Skills formally twice uh, since I came to office. The first occasion was an introductory meeting with Minister Bruton in Dublin before the North-South Ministerial Council plenary meeting. I suppose that was largely almost a, a get-to-know-you uh, session, and despite getting to know me, he wasn't put off by meeting me on a second occasion. So I did have the opportunity to meet um, again with him last week on the 21st of September at the North-South Ministerial uh, Council Educational Sectoral meeting in Armagh, and at that I was accompanied by Junior Minister Megan Fearon. Now, I'm slightly restricted in what I can say about that meeting, as I'll be making a statement to the House next week on that. Uh, but to um, give the member a little bit of a taster to tantalise her, so she's here next week for that. At our meeting, we did discuss a range of educational issues, which included implications of the uh, UK referendum, educational underachievement, special education needs, school, uh, youth and teacher exchanges, teacher qualification and cooperation between uh, education inspectorates. I will be able to go into those in greater detail whenever I make the statement uh, next week. I am committed to developing particularly the opportunities for sharing best practice between our two departments, and I look forward to uh, continuing engagement with Minister Bruton over the months and years to come. Ms. Dillon, first supplementary. Thank the Minister for his response. Can the Minister, 
<coughs> Can I ask the Minister if he has read the Irish Government's recently published action plan for education and if he is familiar with its specific proposals for reducing inequality and tackling disadvantage, including cycles of disadvantage within families and communities? I think it would be important for both administrations on the island of Ireland to work closely together on the issue of tackling disadvantage and underachievement. Well, what is the, the case, and I think um, I haven't read the specific report, and obviously there will be certain decisions which are like purely within the, the remit of the Minister for Education and Skills, which relate to his own jurisdiction. What we are keen is we have a, a, a conference, indeed I think it's uh, scheduled fairly soon, uh, there's a conference particularly on learning sort of um, exchanges between the two jurisdictions, particularly on tackling education under achievement, uh, and I think I'm due to address that so reasonably soon. And I think, as we all appreciate, particularly in circumstances in which, uh, on both sides of the border, um, ministers are trying to deliver the best we can in terms of education, particularly the best we can in terms of education under achievement, on a limited level of resources. I think what is important from all jurisdictions is the learning of best practice, um, because I think, even within Northern Ireland, sometimes I wonder that I see particular areas where there's, there's something very good happening and whether there's necessary knowledge of that uh, nearby. So I'd be keen to see, I think, both from a, a north-south basis and within Northern Ireland, that learning experience and indeed, as I mentioned, which I'll go into in slightly greater detail next week, um, there is one of the agenda items we did discuss was education under achievement and how we can take forward that level of learning by way of practitioners actually exchanging views. And I think. Um, Stand to be correct, I think it's, it's relatively soon there's a, um, uh, a seminar in, I think it's Newry, uh, that may even possibly be next, or in the next few days type of thing, in relation to that, so I will be uh, speaking at that and trying to get that level of learning um, between both jurisdictions uh, on that subject. Well, Mr. Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, would the Minister agree with me that having meetings with education ministers from other legislators in relation to youth service provision would be a worthwhile exercise, and would he be able to keep the provision of youth services on the agenda to discuss with those other ministers to share good practice? Well, as I said, I think I'm always uh, mindful I think, of the need to, as much as possible, share good practice, and I think that is about learning experiences. I think the, uh, it's also sometimes learning where perhaps a jurisdiction has tried something which hasn't worked can also be a very good object lesson. You know, there is the, the old saying that um, uh, sort of a wise person learns from their mistakes, and even wiser person learns from somebody else's mistakes. So I don't know if, if it will be, from that point of view, those of us in Northern Ireland giving the education, or those of us in Northern Ireland having the learning experience where we've seen uh, perhaps other, uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, and I think that in terms of trying to, to learn best practice, whether that's on the basis of educational achievement, whether it's on the basis of youth provision, if there are lessons, you know, I, I think none of us should be arrogant in this House to believe that everything that we have done in every service in Northern Ireland, whether it's education or any other subject, is so perfect that we can't learn lessons from elsewhere and that we can't possibly spread that, those lessons. And whether it's on a, uh, the basis of the Republic of Ireland, whether it's some of the other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom, or indeed further afield, uh, then I, I'm very happy to have those exchanges and be able to, to try and learn those lessons, to try and, I think, all of us collectively in this House We'll be focused in on trying to provide the best possible services for all our young people. And if we can learn from what has happened elsewhere to be able to improve the provision that we make, then I think none of us should be so proud as to uh, accept that everything that we have done is necessarily 100 per cent correct. Call Mr David Hildy. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response so far. What are the NSMC areas of uh, cooperation within the education sector? Well, there are a number of it. Uh, I suppose specifically, um, the Council meets, I think, in common policies and approaches. It will be areas such as education for children with special needs, and very specifically, obviously, in the north-south basis, we have the Middletown uh, Centre, uh, educational achievement, which I've mentioned, the issue about teacher qualifications to try to ensure that there aren't artificial barriers there, and indeed, particularly in terms of exchanges, and that can happen on school level, a teach, teacher level, or a, a youth level. Uh, I suppose in each of the areas of cooperation, there are common policies and approaches uh, are agreed. Uh, by the North South Ministerial Council, but implemented separately in each jurisdiction. And I suppose, as with some of the relationship that will be there from the Department of Education in Northern Ireland with our counterparts, for instance, at Westminster, or indeed other jurisdictions, uh, I suppose one of the issues where there's not entirely, or there's a certain level of mismatch, is that in terms of the um, particular remit of the Department of Education, we will particularly concentrate then on children's services, 
through primary schools and secondary education. Um, for instance, the Department of uh, Education and Skills in the Republic of Ireland would be closer to, if you like, a DE plus DL. So they will deal, for instance, all around issues around training, skills, um, and dealing with the further and higher education. So there's not, there will be some as aspects which there isn't that particular uh, match up in that regard. But uh, I suppose those main issues that I've, I've listed are the ones that would be um, where there's the most direct uh, interface with. Call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Question for. I can remember for his question. The Delivering Social Change Literacy and Numeracy Signature Project has been shown to be successful in particular in enabling schools to develop effective ways of developing and targeting underachievement and putting in place appropriate intervention strategies to raise attainment. As part of the dissemination of the legacy of the programme, the Education Authority produced publications for primary and post-primary schools entitled Literacy and Numeracy Legacy. These resources identified a number of longer-term benefits derived by the schools, teachers and pupils as a result of taking part in the programme. For example, the value of increased and external uh, collaboration by teachers within and across schools, the positive impact of the professional development opportunities provided uh, by the programme and the benefits of effective parental engagement. Perhaps most importantly, pupils supported by the programme showed an increase in self-confidence and uh, greater engagement with the whole curriculum. The legacy publications have been circulated to all schools, and I'm aware that some school leaders are already mainstreaming the effective approaches to targeting and tackling underachievement that were developed under delivering social change. I think we have a lot to learn from the Signature Programme, and I'll be exploring further ways in which I can help take forward the legacy of the Signature Programme. Mr McMullen, first supplement. Oh, I can, can I thank the Minister for his question? But Minister, uh, can I ask you further, has your department and the executive any plans to reintroduce, reintroduce the, leg, the, the legacy and literacy? And, and would you agree it has made a massive difference to, to the young people and widening the net for the school meeting entitlement? Could you give an, a, 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 could you give an entitlement today that uh, you, will, you will think about reintroducing it? It's something we'll always keep open. And I think, first of all, I think there's a number of aspects to this. There is taking the lessons that have already been learned and ensuring that they are mainstreamed and legacied. In terms of the, the programme itself, um, and I would certainly uh, concur with what I think has been the, the positive um, response that has, that has happened as a result of it. We've got to remember that in terms of the funding of this, and I think this is why this is to some extent a question also for the, the wider executive, um, the programme itself was centrally funded and time limited by the executive. The cost of the programme uh, was £15.8 over three financial years, out of which um, £13.8 was provided centrally by the executive. Now, if there was central funding as provided by the executive for this programme or a successor in title, uh, I would certainly be very keen to, to see it rolled out. Um, in the absence of, of central funding, I will be looking at ways in which successful interventions developed by the schools can be sustained in the long term. And it's about also as with other things, learning a level of, of lessons. Uh, in the short term, primarily, it's for school leavers to mainstream the approaches to tackling underachievement uh, that have been shown to be effective in many of the schools supported by uh, delivering social change. And I'm aware from the feedback from the evaluation of pro the programme that is actually already happening in many schools. Uh, the managing authorities, the Education Authority and CCMS, have also a role to play, and they will be using what they've learned from the implementation and management of the programmes to support schools in their work, to target and address underachievement, and to try and raise attainment levels across the school system. Oh, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister why he thinks approximately 35 per cent of pupils in Northern Ireland are not achieving numeracy of uh, grade C or above in GCSE maths, and what specific reforms or investments he plans to help increase attainment in this area? We've got to remember that in terms of our overall performance, um, there has been improvements in terms of GCSE, there's been improvements in terms of A-level, uh, and particularly in terms of, in recent years, the gaps between uh, the level of attainment of those on free school meals and those not on free school meals has actually been closing. It's, there's been a greater, swifter level of improvement on um, free school meals entitled pupils than non-free school meals entitled pupils. So I think I want to see that in, uh, increasing. There has also been a situation that there has been a much greater uptake of mathematics. Now, whether that also means that 
that if you like the standard then tends to slightly dip, maybe another question mark. Mathematics, for, I think I'm right in saying, is, is for the second year running the, um, the most popular GCSE that, uh, that has been provided in that regard. Uh, I think from that point of view, I think there are lessons that said to be learned from the, the mainstreaming of the, uh, if you like, the sort of delivery on, on numeracy and literacy. As with, I think, a lot of interventions, particularly if you're tackling underachievement, there's also going to be a little bit of patience uh, taken with that as well, uh, which is to ensure that where you have that intervention, because I think the most effective intervention is early intervention, but where you have, for instance, various schemes of early intervention, it might be 10 years or 12 years before you actually see the direct dividends. So we've got to always look and ensure that we don't necessarily simply have, have quick fixes. And I think there's also, in terms of there's any way that I can assist that, that process whenever we come to look at curriculum review, um, I think that's also something that, that should be encouraged. But I think one of the encouraging, particularly as regards mathematics, both mathematics in particular and STEM in total, we've seen a steady increase in the number of, of pupils taking that. And I think that is also something to be positively uh, welcome. So I, I don't know if maybe the only difference between myself and the member is I'm maybe looking at this a little bit as glass half full. Maybe the member might be looking at it a little bit more as glass half empty. I remind members wishing to ask a question that they should continually rise in their seats. Call Ms. Johnny Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his response thus far? Minister, uh, you have indicated that uh, the funding was over 15 million centrally for, to deliver the literacy and numeracy signature programme. Would the Minister give a commitment that he will provide at least some of the budget going forward for the, uh, to deliver it through the mainstream programme within the schools in the interim? The project has actually completed, so it's not a question of it continuing on. It's actually about trying to ensure that the lessons from it are, are mainstream. The bulk of the money, as I said, did come centrally, and I think there are a range of activities which are already happening on that, on that basis. Am I in a position to give additional funding today in relation to that? No, I, I can't give that commitment today. But what I think is the case, I think we need to look at an executive as a whole as to how we potentially take this, this forward. Um, you know, and I think in particular, I suppose one of the areas that we do need to look at is that, that there has obviously been widespread concern over the level of funding directly of schools. Now, to some extent, before we look at additional programmes or new programmes, we need to ensure that, that actually we're getting the maximum amount that we can uh, to the existing resources and existing need that is there before we look at additional programmes. But I think it's a question in that sense from a funding point of view for the executive as a whole. Call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank Mr. Speaker. Question number five, please. Um, thank the member for this question. I know that it's an issue which has a particular level of, of interest, and in. I look forward, I think, in the near future to be uh, visiting the um, Bally Bean to, to look at the, uh, at the issue uh, with him. So I'm, I'm committed to ensuring that every child receives high quality education that enables them to fulfil their potential. Uh, responding to the education authority, sorry, funding the education authority ensures that there's a range of educational provision to support children with SEN, including autism, and that includes mainstream provision, uh, learning support centres attached to mainstream schools, and special school provision. The authority is working, I think, to enhance uh, autism-specific learning support centre provision throughout the region. The Education Authority's Autism Activity and um, Intervention Service provides support to pupils in schools throughout training um, and advice to teachers and individual, individual interventions with pupils. It also provides support to parents. In addition, my department provides funding to the Middletown Centre for Autism, which has enabled, uh, the, uh, which has enabled to expand its programme of direct support and intervention to children with complex autism that are referred by the Education Authority and to provide professional and parental training and research services. And, and may I say that for anybody who has an interest in this subject, uh, I think that if you want to actually learn a great deal more about it. I think a, a visit, for instance, to Middletown is something, as I did earlier on uh, this year, is something that's extremely worthwhile uh, time spent. Since the launch of the Northern Ireland's Executive's Autism Strategy and Action Plan, the Department of Education has been working closely with the Education Authority and Middletown Centre for Autism and other departments on implementation of its actions. These include delivering training programmes for teachers, educational professionals, youth workers and parents, and providing effective support for pupils with autism. Uh, we're also working, I suppose, in collaboration with health and social care trusts. Uh, and I see at that point, maybe I'll, I'll curtail the rest of my answer as the time appears to have run out on that, on that question. 
Members, that ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr Danny Kennedy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister uh, provide the House uh, with an update on the preparation and publication of the area-based plans by the Education Authority? Uh, thank the member for his question. That is something I think which is likely to happen very imminently. On Friday, I chaired a meeting of the Area Planning Strategic Group. Uh, I think one of the advantages, uh, I suppose, with, with regard to area planning, everybody has accepted the concept of area planning in the past, but there has been, and I know, for instance, previously from the Education Committee, a degree of criticism on the issue of implementation of area planning. One of the things I think we have tried very much to get right this time is to ensure that representatives of all the different sectors around the table. Arising out of that meeting, I would anticipate the Education Authority publishing its overall area plan for Northern Ireland uh, fairly imminently, within probably the next week or two. It will then go out to consultation for about uh, two months. Now, the area plan was a limited problem I can directly say about that. It will be high level and strategic in its nature, but it's likely, for instance, to contain particular provisions as regards special needs schools and also will drill down into the particular, the overall needs of divided on a council basis area of the 11 councils. The aim would then be to move ahead um, with whatever changes happen in terms of after consultation to look then at sort of an annual plans because the, the area plan would due to be on a three year basis of from 17 to 2020 uh, and also then to move towards specific plans uh, at a, a more localised area to put more meat on the bones in that regard. Mr Kennedy for a supplement. Thank the Minister for his uh, reply so far. And given the, the historic uh, delays uh, involved in, in, in all of these processes, what is the time scale uh, for the area plans to be completed uh, and, and how will he and his department encourage uh, those deadlines to be met? We will look and I think there's, there's a realisation that there needs to be a step change in terms of the work that happens in terms of area planning because simply letting things drift at times doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help any of the, the schools. It creates greater levels of uncertainty. It also means that whenever there needs to be a reallocation of resources within the, the broader sort of schools area plan, that, that, that doesn't happen. Um, as I said, we're, we are in a position that, that it should be very imminently the, the main plan itself is published, which will be under a two-month consultation period. I think I'm acutely aware uh, that what that will require is probably a reprofiling of a certain amount of resources within education authority and indeed whatever support the department needs to give uh, to, the, um, to the education authority will, will be given to try to ensure that, that we move ahead, if you like, in a timely, timely fashion. But as I said, uncertainty, whether it's at a, on a broader area level um, or whether it's at the level of the individual school doesn't help anyone. So I think that, that I want to see movement ahead as, as, as quickly as possible on some of those things, while ensuring that there's proper consultation as well alongside that. Mr Alex Maskey. I got Con Kiola, could I ask the Minister, could he confirm that all special needs children seeking admission to preschool uh, provision in mainstream schools have secured a place, but also acknowledge then that not all of those children who are seeking admission to preschool uh, special school provision have been placed, and that's now four weeks into the school term. Check in relation. My understanding was I think that places have been provided for all children with, with special needs in that regard. But I'm due to appear, I think, in front of the committee on the uh, 12th of October, and therefore I'll be able to provide greater level of statistics within that. Uh, I think that there was a, a level of increase, particularly at nursery level, on uh, because the advantage of you like early diagnosis means that we can tackle problems at an earlier stage. Uh, the problem, uh, I suppose, with that for the education system is that it has to react a lot quicker to actually finding places for people. So consequently, I think, particularly on the nursery provision on special needs, there will be an ongoing process with the EA to try and provide a much more strategic direction for that, uh, obviously grounded in proper discussion and consultation, particularly with both experts and parents groups, uh, as we move ahead. It will be the case, as with um, all provision at nursery education, we have a situation in which the vast bulk of um, those who are seeking a preschool place um, are able to be catered for, um, but it's not everybody that, that would necessarily always get their, their, their first place in that regard. If, however, there are specific issues in terms of be it individual areas or where there's been a problem in terms of anybody obtaining a place at all, then I'd be very happy if the member wants to, 
give me the details of those specific bits, and we will try and get answers uh, for him. I'll ask you for a supplementary. Uh, come on, I would appreciate the Minister um, for that commitment and I will come back to him uh, there were some details. I mean, my understanding is that there are a number of children who have applied for such provision uh, for preschool space and schools provision that has not yet fully been met. So I would just make the point to the Minister I'm grateful for his commitment to look into this. But if that were the case, I mean I think people would have to say it would amount to not only disparity but possibly discrimination against a very important section of our community. So I will come back to the Minister on that. From the, the point of view of placements, uh, my understanding is, although it's the, the people who it's an operational matter in terms of the direct placements with the Education Authority, my understanding is that the places have been found for everybody. Now, the, the issue to some extent is, are those necessarily in the places where people wanted them as their first choice on that basis? Is it of exactly the nature that, uh, for instance, the parents wanted? And uh, we have a situation that across the board in terms of preschool places, uh, you've got a, a mix of, I think, about 62% of children will get part-time places and 38% will get full-time places. Now, there will not always be a particular uh, match from what the parents necessarily want. So th I suppose the issue is whether th someone has been denied a place entirely or whether there was a desire to have a particular place, say, in a particular location, or indeed where someone has wanted a full-time place and been, what has been available has been a part-time place. So it's, it's, the key bit is actually trying to ensure at least there is a place for everyone, but it will not necessarily be that everyone will get precisely what they're, what they're looking for. But if it's a question of people being denied a place entirely, then again, we'd be happy to take up the specific examples of that. Well, Mr. Philip Logan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what was the Minister's assessment of the uh, Queen's University's uh, Nurture Unit Evaluation Report? I attended the, the launch of that, that report and I heard particularly some of the worked examples that were there within schools. It affects um, the scheme, if you like, covers 32 uh, primary schools. I, I was very encouraged in terms of the response that we got at that. Uh, there's a clear, one of the, the clear indications was that, again, by way of intervention, uh, you have a situation that, particularly for some vulnerable children, children that need that degree of help, it has been of tremendous value to them. Uh, there's a clear distinction it draws in the report between um, children in schools where that nurture uh, units have been made available and those outside the system. Um, and similarly, I think one of the things which, which came across very clearly from the report was that in terms of the intervention, in terms of nurture units, when it was happening within the schools, because there's a limited number of children that will be involved directly within uh, the, the nurture units themselves, but there was actually a whole school improvement that indeed the children across the board um, had, uh, you know, had that. I, I've taken, not simply, if you like, from the direct evidence of what was in the report, but I've, I've had the opportunity, uh, both in my time as Minister, indeed one briefly before I became Minister, to visit a number of schools where nurture units have been made available, and it's undoubtedly the case you, you get a, a real sense, uh, a real pastoral sense of, of support for children within those, and I think they've been able to take full advantage uh, of that. Mr Logan, for a supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for, uh, for his answer. What assurances can you give to schools who are currently in receipt uh, of funding for nurture, nurture units? Well, we're in a position that I think the next step then is looking at what way this can be in some way mainstreamed. Now, whether that means there's, there's a range of options within that, and some of that will also depend upon the level of funding that will be made available, because I think there would be a strong desire to see a, a, an expansion if possible, but we also sort of live within a level of, of budgetary constraints. Uh, that, even in terms of designing a, a way forward in a system, will take a, a period of time and may take different directions in relation to that. But I want to place on record very clearly uh, that until we have a new scheme which is agreed and in a position to be implemented, that funding will continue for the nurture units for, at, uh, for all 32 schools that are currently being funded under the, uh, under the nurture unit provision. I think it's important. Um, that there are no gaps in provision, that people are not left in a situation in which it is stopped in their school and may well then, because of a different scheme, then find themselves reinstated at a later stage. I think it's important that, uh, that at the very least, until we reach a point in which there is a, a new scheme out there, which may benefit more schools than that, may benefit sometimes different schools from, from what is there. There's a range of different models. Um, but until that we reach that point, there's an absolute guarantee that I will make that as a priority and ensure that, that those schools will be funded during that period. Well, Mr. Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer so, thus far. 
the Minister will be aware of St Mary's High School Brolla in Balik, which in June last year ranked 10th uh, out of all the schools across the North in GCSE results. However, this school has been threatened with closure for a number of years, and while plans for a pilot study in merging the school with Donegal School seem to have stalled, can the Minister give any reassurances uh, for the pupils of St Mary's and their families that the school will not be closing in the foreseeable future? Well, in terms of, I suppose directly speaking, in terms of what the issue on development, there's potentially in terms of development proposals, there's a legal restriction on what I can say. Uh, let me say, the member says that uh, I'll be aware of the, uh, the, the situation in St Mary's. I, I would say if I wasn't aware of it, the member would be very quick to remind me. I know he's been very proactive on behalf of the, the school. Uh, can I, underst I understand that previously the previous minister asked CCMS to look at the possibility, uh, looked at what the options were, at the possibility of a cross-border delivery model as an alternative to the closure. And at that stage then work was developed by CCMS, but whenever they, there was analysis at that stage, I think which dated from 2014 going into 2015, um, that in terms of the cross-border approach, it wouldn't be either cost-effective or quality threshold, we'd be assured on that basis. So that clearly didn't appear to be a runner. What I think is the case, so simply, if you like, that proposal doesn't appear to be something that will be that is doable. What I have asked is that CCMS, I think it's important that the first level of engagement, because CCMS are, the, um, are essentially the provider body, that, uh, that they engage particularly with the school on future provision. So I think there's a, a clearly a conversation that needs to be held to see what other options and what alternatives uh, can be there. Rick Phillips for supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank the Minister for his response. Obviously, the concerns of the closure have been looming for the last number of years, and I'm aware that the Minister is relatively new to the post. And in that context, uh, with the closure looming, uh, I was made that perfectly aware of that when I visited a Board of Governors meeting recently with my party colleagues, Councillors Coyle and Gallagher. In that respect and in that context, would the Minister give a commitment to visit the school with myself and meet with the Board of Governors to hear their concerns? I'm, ha I'm happy, sir, to, to go to the ends of the earth with you in terms of uh, any school visits in that regard. Uh, but I suppose seriously, if, if there's a, an invitation comes in, I'll be more than happy to consider that. And I think that uh, I'm happy to visit schools. Now, again, simply visiting a school does not mean that either it's the kiss of death or alternatively that there's some level of revival for that school. So I think where the concentration, and particularly as it's the managing authority of CCMS, the initial discussion in terms of any possibilities can't be on the basis, of, I think, of what was there previously. I think that was explored very thoroughly by CCMS, by officials, and it's found not to be honest. So we need probably some level of, of fresh thinking within that. And I think, at first instance, probably there needs to be that discussion between uh, CCMS um, and the school. But as part of uh, my general tour of schools in Northern Ireland, uh, I'm sure I'll be happy to accommodate uh, visiting uh, St Mary's, and I'm make sure that obviously the member will be, if the invitation comes comes to him, that he will be ensure that he's invited to that visit as well. Call Ms. Claire Bailey for a quick question and a quick response from the Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister for um, his assessment of whether a consistent approach to the teaching of relationship and sexuality education in all our schools would help reduce educational inequalities. I think that there's an important issue in terms of um, the RSE uh, teaching in that regard. I think from that point of view, I think we want to see as much consistency as possible, uh, and I think it, it's maybe less about removing inequalities, but try to make sure that all children are, are equipped to deal with um, the complex uh, questions that, that, that face them uh, on, a, on a regular basis. There's obviously, in terms of the pure implementation, uh, what happens directly in the classroom, you know, I'm not going to be in a position necessarily to micromanage that. I'm not there sort of um, correcting textbooks or... Uh, ensuring precisely what lesson plan. I think as much consistency as, as possible is something uh, of advantage, but I appreciate that uh, there will be sensitivities around this, this issue, and I think it is important, I think, that, that we give schools a little bit of space to be able to deliver uh, on that curriculum. Time for a very quick supplementary and a very quick response. Thank you, Speaker. Um, if, thank you for your answer, Minister. If that being the case, um, could you let us know how the Department then uh, evaluates the education that does happen in our schools? The evaluation, indeed, with a, a range of other issues, will be subject to ETI inspection, the, uh, the Education and Training Inspectorate, who will look at a wide range of subjects that are provided within schools. They are essentially, and they are, well, they're funded by the Department. They're essentially at arm's length. 
and will provide that level of independent evaluation. I think it's important uh, that the relationship in that sense is not so close uh, that there is any degree of question of bias within that. And I have great faith in the ETI to be able to provide that level of inspection. They already do that as regards uh, RSE, and I think we'll continue to do that, continue to do it in a very effective and professional manner. Time is up.